Good morning and welcome to worship. We're so glad to have you with us. My name is Pastor Heidi Hankel and it's my joy to lead you in worship today. We're talking about our new normal. Now, Easter changed everything for the disciples and today as we are living through this social distancing and quarantine during a pandemic, we are learning about new normals. So I invite you to join me in our worship today as we learn how to let go and let God fill in the space that we are going to create as we discern with his wisdom. Let's begin today with our call to worship. The Lord who calls us to worship today is the same Jesus who refused the temptation to worship the evil one. Rather than receive the glorious kingdoms of this world, he endured the shame of the cross. And today is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now are gathered in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, glory and power. With the saints of all ages, we say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are steadfast and faithful. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we pray that as we move through this new day, that your Holy Spirit in us would speak, that you would connect with us through song, through prayer, and through scripture. We pray, God, draw near to us as we draw near to you and inhabit our praise today. Amen. Join me in singing our first worship song today. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all
As we lift up our hearts to God and receive his grace and mercy as we confess our sins together. If at times we deny you, God, forgive. When the risks of discipleship are high and we are nowhere to be found, God, forgive. When we wash our hands of responsibility, God, forgive. When we cast our lot with powerful oppressors, and seek to buy freedom with silver, God forgive. When fear keeps us from witnessing to your truth or prejudice keeps us from believing it, God forgive. In the bright light of Easter morning, O oh God, our sin is exposed and your grace is revealed. Tender God, raise us in your love so that with joy we may witness to your awesome deeds. In the name of Jesus, the risen one. Amen. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Friends, join me in our next hymn, Change My Heart, O oh God. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the power.
We continue on the work of the church in our community today, impacting families who are struggling right now. We have been able to provide groceries for families. We have been able to help families who are struggling in the midst. You can be a part of that today by giving in three particular ways. You can go to our website at BethesdaPC.com and click on give. You can mail your tithe into the church. The mail is secure and is picked up regularly. Or you can set up a bill pay through your bank. Friends, the work continues as we are the church that goes out into the world. And we invite you to be a part of that this day. Join me as we give God all the glory in our doxology this morning. and welcome to our kids time. If you're a kid or a kid at heart, I invite you to come a little bit closer today so that Zoe and I can talk to you today. I'd like to know, what do you dream about? What is the last thing that you remember dreaming about? Were you <laughs> racing? Were you outdoors taking a walk? Were you playing with your friends? the last thing that you dreamed about? What do you think it is that God dreams about? It's an interesting question, huh? Because we often talk about dreams being during when we sleep. Yeah, sleepy. But there's also dreams, like hopes and dreams. And what do you think God's dream is? Did you know that you can have dreams for other people? Like, what do you hope for for your friends, what do you dream that they can do? Maybe that they come in first in the soccer uh, toilet? <laughs> now wait, what do you dream of? Do you dream of touching your toes? <laughs> do you dream of walking? Do you dream of walking one day? Do you? Yeah. Well, I think we should investigate what God dreams each day and what God hopes for for you and I. And to do that, we're going to read a book together today. And it's a book written by a man named Desmond Tutu. Sounds kind of a funny name, right? Desmond Tutu. So Desmond Tutu is a priest in South Africa that's on a different continent. And he was a really important person who helped to bring about peace and justice. Those are two really big things that God is for in our lives. God wants to bring peace and he wants to bring justice. And so this priest helped people to forgive. He helped people to reconcile and he worked with uh, that nation's leader, Nelson Mandela, to help bring peace and justice into a this country, the South African country. And for doing that, he was awarded one of the biggest prizes out there, the Nobel Peace Prize. So he continues to bring God's good news to everyone. He continues to be a minister there. And we're gonna read a book that he wrote, and it is called God's Dream. God's Dream. So let's take a look and read this book together today. It says, Dear Child of God, what do you dream of in your loveliest dreams? Do you dream of a rainbow reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires? or about being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be. Do you know what God dreams of? Close your eyes and look with your heart, dear child. 
All right, let's do that now. Everybody close your eyes and look. What do you think God dreams of? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let's open them. God dreams about people sharing. Yeah. Look at all the kids. They're playing together and inviting one another to come and play with them. Can we show everybody? You hold that side and mom, you'll hold this side. Yeah. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. Yeah, look at the people caring. Right? And helping the cat and helping one another. Let's see what else? God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to be together. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. And then we feel sad and very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. Yeah, let's show them the pictures. Let's show them the pictures. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. You hold that side, mom, you'll hold this side. Yeah, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are brothers and sisters. Yes, even you and me. Even if we have different mummies and daddies or live in different far away lands. Let's show them the pictures. Even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin, Even if you are taller and I am smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is large, your child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It is really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring. As easy as holding and playing and laughing, as easy as knowing we are one big family because we are all God's children. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. The end. Sometimes we think about dreams are all about obtaining big, great things one day doing the impossible or doing something big and great. But the truth is, God's dream for you and I is they would just simply care about one another and share with one another and forgive one another and just simply love one another and giggle with joy, right? <laughs> so I invite you this week in very simple ways to make God's dream come true by caring and sharing around the house with maybe your brothers and sisters to love on mom and dad and grandma and grandpa this week, to forgive one another even when we hurt each other, and to remember that God's dream comes true when you and I do these very things with each other. I pray that you are blessed this week. Have a wonderful week. And we say together, yay, God!
Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Friends, hear the word of God from the book that we love. The evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. M. Scott Peck, the famous author, once said that the truth that our finest moments are most likely to occur when we are feeling uncomfortable, unhappy, and unfulfilled. For it's only today in such moments that we are propelled by our discomfort and we are likely to step out of our ruts and to start searching for different ways or truer answers. It's only when we're uncomfortable, unfulfilled, unhappy, that we actually start moving out of the comfort zone and we start searching. This is so true for our disciples in our scripture this morning. We meet the disciples uh, right after Christ has been resurrected. We see what they're like that evening, and then we see what happens a week later. And so I want to take a look at our scripture today, and I want you to listen for three particular questions. I want you to ask yourself, what is it that we are used to? Maybe just used to in our life or even used to as church. What are we used to? I want you to ask, what makes me uncomfortable? And what makes us as the church uncomfortable? And then your third question is, what needs to change the way we think of ministry? Or maybe you want to ask it singularly, what needs to change the way I think of ministry? Okay. What am we used to? What are we uncomfortable with? And what needs to change about the way we do ministry? Like the... Easter story that changes everything, we are living in a day in which everything has changed. And we can't return to the way things were. And so the question becomes, what is our way forward? <clears throat> the disciples are again in their upper room. They've come to the tomb, they've heard Mary say he's alive. They're huddled still in this upper room. They're just there. 
And some of them are still in grief and disbelief. And Jesus comes and he says, peace be with you. Now, why does he need to state peace be with you? Why does he even need to make that his opening greeting? And I think if we can put ourselves in the disciples' shoes to suddenly see a person appear in front of you in the room, you're going to be a bit freaked out. Let's be honest. We would be a bit freaked out. We would be very radically uncomfortable. Because to us, if you want to enter a room, you do it through a door or you do it through a window. But you notice after the resurrection happens, Jesus doesn't use doors anymore. <laughs> it always says he appears, he appears, he appears. He never comes through the door. After the resurrection, he tells us, we're the ones who have to knock on the door, at, knock, seek, and ask, right? And I will enter. That's what God says. So Jesus, the one of the things the resurrection changes is Jesus is no longer subject to our physical limitations. He is no longer limited in his humanity. He is revealing the bigness of who he is. And it is unsettling for us as human beings. It's big. It is a bit frightening because it's new and it's different. Whoo! So he says to the disciples, peace be with you. And the disciples receive him in that moment. And then it tells us a week later, you know, Jesus appears to them again. And we have this interlude that tells us that when the disciples share their story of meeting Jesus with Thomas, that Thomas said, I'll believe it when I see it. That's the shorthand of what he said. I'll believe it when I see it. And he says, I'll believe it when I touch his hands and see the nail marks. Okay. So Jesus comes again a week later. And this time Thomas is with them. And when he comes, he opens up with the same greeting again. Peace be with you. It's funny. The very first thing that God wants to give us is his peace. I think there's a sense that he understands just how radical this is going to be for you and I, how uncomfortable this is, but he also wants to impart his peace to us. He knows what it is to be human and how hard it is to walk this journey. And so he says, peace be with you. And this time Thomas touches those hands and the feet and he believes. And Jesus responds and he says, as the father had sent me, now I am sending you. That's right. This is the next piece that Easter changes. Jesus says, guess what? I did these things. I came here. I died on the cross. And now I'm going to send you. And he breathes the Holy Spirit into them. He gives them God to dwell in them. So he doesn't expect them to do this of their own power. He enables them the same way he received the Holy Spirit at baptism and was able to do miracles after that. He breathes the Holy Spirit into them that they now have God dwelling inside of them, just like you and I do today from when we were baptized. He instructs them about power. He says, okay, as you have this power now, as you forgive, then things will be forgiven. So as you, as you do, it will happen. That's how much power is inside of you now. And if you decide to withhold that power, it will be withheld. Whew. Wow. Think about that for a minute. Suddenly these disciples went from being in despair and in disbelief to now being indwelt with God and having that power flowing through them. Whew. We're uncomfortable with power if we're honest. If we are honest, we are not all that comfortable with it. We tend to go one of two ways. We either tend to shy away from it and not want it, or we tend to let our ego get a bit out of control and self-righteous with it, and we don't handle power well. Now, the key to this is allowing the Holy Spirit to be the driver of the power, allowing the Holy Spirit to be the one in the driver's seat that's leading you and guiding you and showing how this power gets used. But Thomas, Thomas is, we'll believe it when we see it, right? And if we're honest, we're a lot like Thomas. We're not very trusting. We tend to be skeptical. We tend to doubt things that don't make sense. 
Thomas wants to see it. He wants to be able to have some type of physical proof of who God is and this power. So God, when he shows up the second time, he says to Thomas, touch my hands. Feel these nail marks. See where I was pierced. And blessed are you, those who have not seen and yet still believed. Blessed are you. Now that's faith, man. It's faith to be able to believe something that we don't see. It's faith to believe in something that we don't quite understand. It's faith to walk in a way and walk in accordance with God when we just don't quite understand it. You know, in this story, God says, I have written these things so that you might believe and have life. And we like that part of the Easter story, right? We like to say, we believe. And then we insulate ourselves inside four walls and say, we're doing church. But that's not the Easter story. The Easter story is believe in me and go, right? Jesus said, I am sending you. The way the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The call today, this call after Easter is to believe in the resurrected God and then to go forth as he sends us. Now, if we're honest about this, we have a little bit of a difficult time with this. You know, ministry, we tend to do inside our church walls and feel good about it, but we tend to be uncomfortable about going out of those walls and into the world. And yet the great commandment, and we're going to talk about this, the great commission that God commands us to do is to go forth into the world, making disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we take a look at this, we struggle going out in the world, and we're not really sure why. So let's ask the question, what does ministry actually look like? If we're being honest about this, what does ministry actually look like? It's about going out and engaging people. We have to engage people in acts of mercy and in compassion, acts of justice and of love. We're talking about being there in the gap for people. Not just saying we're Christian, but living it in very tangible ways. Ministry is when we go and we meet people that we don't even know. People that don't know Christ. And we sit and we listen. And we talk with them. We pray with them. We demonstrate justice and love and forgiveness to them. And we share the good news of God with people out there in the world. Now, if you are a person who says, well, most of my friends already know God, then it's maybe time for you to make some new friends. It's time to go and talk with other people. It's time to meet other people. But we're uncomfortable with that. Even as I say that now, there's a bit of uncomfortableness and unsettledness inside of you. Pastor Heidi, why are you preaching this today? This isn't a happy sermon. You know, the problem is, the truth is that we're uncomfortable outside our church walls. We are uncomfortable with the messiness of life and the messiness of people. We are uncomfortable with the messiness of humanity. You know, Thomas says, I'll believe it when I see it. And when Jesus comes to him and gives him an answer, that answer is not a clean, comfortable answer. That answer is, Thomas, take your physical hands and touch my scarred, pierced hands. Now, I want you to picture actually physically doing that with somebody. That is uncomfortable. It's a bit gross. It's extremely messy. It's certainly not safe in our pandemic world. All right, it's messy. It is absolutely messy. If we want to engage people in this world, it is not going to be clean. It is not going to be organized. It is not going to be um, easy. It is messy and it is hard because the true, honest word about you and I is we are a holy hot messes. 
We are holy hot messes that God is just working on. We are train wrecks without any easy answers. That's what sin is in our life. And that is part of who we are. Because as God is transforming us and making us holy, it's a messy journey. You know, we're also uncomfortable with pain and suffering. Nobody really wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I would have experienced pain and suffering today. We are having a hard time entering into it with one another. When we listen to people who are suffering and in pain, we can only listen to so much and then we want to give them a platitude. We want to tie it up in a nice bow. Well, maybe you need to just do this. And there, I've given you the solution. Now go and do it and be free of your pain. We have a hard time going, sitting next to the person, wherever they're at, even if it's in the ashes, we have a hard time just sitting there and listening and being because it feels uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel happy. It doesn't feel joyous. And yet that's exactly what God did for you and I. And that's exactly what he calls us to do. It wasn't comfortable for him to leave his throne and come down here to earth for you and I. It wasn't comfortable for him to go and be tempted in the desert. It isn't comfortable for him to be hungry or to not be able to sleep or to have anxiety or to see his people mistreated, to see his people oppressed. None of that was comfortable for him, let alone die on a cross for you and I. And yet he did it to enter in for you and I. And today he says, go, just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Go enter into people's messiness. Go enter in and sit there and be there with them. Bring good news. Bring hope. Bring mercy. Bring compassion. Bring justice. Bring love with you and just be there with them. Engage them there. It would be so much easier if we didn't have to encounter this messiness. And we see that played out in the stories that Jesus told us, like the Good Samaritan, people who walk by somebody hurting and broken on the side of the road. And while they smile and they say, oh, I can't help that person. You know, we have all of our excuses of why we don't want to enter into the mess with people. We're just uncomfortable with it. We'd rather not see homeless people. We'd rather not see poverty in our midst. We'd rather not see immigration in our midst because we're uncomfortable with the mess of dealing with it. But the mess involves people that God dearly loves and desperately wants to know him. And because of that factor, you and I are called to engage, engage it for acts of justice and mercy and love. And we're uncomfortable because we have separated and we have isolated ourselves. You know, the definition of being made holy means to be made apart, to almost be separated and be made different than the rest. But we've taken that to a whole new level as the church. In some cases, we find ourselves so holy that we don't want to be infected by the rest of the world or the culture. And we unfortunately have lost the kingdom mentality because God's kingdom says, go into the world and you bring the kingdom with you. Because you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and you bear the light of Christ, wherever you go, you bring the kingdom with you. And the kingdom of God is what influences the culture. The kingdom of God is what can influence what's happening in the world. Being made holy doesn't mean to be set apart, that we isolate ourselves out from the world. It means that we are being made holy with Christ. We are being transformed in the midst of our mess, and it's our job to be in the world, letting the world see that transformation happen with us, letting God see and show all of our rough edges so that others can see them too and see a God that works in the midst of the mess. And so because we have isolated ourselves in the church walls, because we have separated ourselves out and we think that's what it is to be holy, we've become uncomfortable with being in the world and bringing God to this world. And instead of acknowledging our doubts, like Thomas does, instead of acknowledging our imperfections and our struggles, 
We try to be perfect Christians. We try to be good and perfect. We notice everybody else's imperfections. We notice everybody else's mistakes and their sins. And we don't do anything about our own. Perhaps one of the greatest things that you and I can do to teach this world about God is to show what repentance looks like. To show that we're aware of our mess and we're aware of a God who forgives us in the midst of our mess. And we repent honestly and truthfully. And we show a changed attitude and a changed heart. So what do we do with all this? Easter has come. It's a new normal for the disciples. And even today for you and I, we're facing a bit of a new normal. And the question becomes, now what do we do? As we have had this pause in our life in which we have been socially distancing and for some of you quarantining, we have had a moment to pause. And this is a moment in which you and I can discern before God. So there's a couple of things we need to start asking. We need to start asking and evaluating and praying and talking with God about what has our lives been filled with? What have our lives been filled with? You know, for the disciples, their life was filled with grief, despair. They were followers. And they went where the social crowd took them. But prior to this, they kind of went wherever Jesus went. And they went wherever the crowd kind of went. And they evaluated everything based on the crowd. And now it's changed for them. They are now filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead them into being leaders. The Holy Spirit is going to lead them out into the world. Instead of looking for Christ to follow, they, it, the follower is going to be in them. They are going out with the Holy Spirit into the unknown. Second question we're going to ask is, what of that stuff that my life has been filled with needs to stay? And what needs to go? We are pretty good at filling our life with lots of stuff, with TV, with games, with appointments, with social gatherings, with food. We have an ability to fill our lives with a lot of stuff. It's almost like as soon as we find an invention that boils the time down for us, we fill our lives with other stuff. We immediately fill that space up. You know, years ago, people had to wash the dishes by hand. They didn't have dishwashers in their house. In fact, some of the apartments in New York City and some of the other cities still don't have dishwashers. Years ago, people didn't have washing machines to wash their clothes in. They had to do it by hand. And these machines gave us our time back. They do the work for us so we don't have to spend the time doing it. So what have we done with the time we've gained back from all of our modern technology? How much more TV do we watch? How many more games do we play? How much more sleeping do we do? What are we filling our life with? How much more work are we adding in when God frees up space in our life? See, there are things that we have been doing and God is giving us the chance to evaluate our lives and take stock of the way our lives have been going and to change, to make some course corrections here. Some of us have been filling space in our lives to avoid dealing with issues to avoid dealing with some tasks that are right in front of us. A friend of mine said to me, she had successfully filled her entire life with so much stuff to do, so she never had to address all the things that she had collected in her house and saved in her house. And now that she's home all the time, she is surrounded by all of it. There is no more avoiding it anymore. She has to deal with it. What are the things in your life that you are filling your life with reflects God, what if it actually is about getting up and going out like the disciples were called to do? What if it is about being among the mess and entering into the mess? And how can you today bring God to your own hot mess and be honest with him about the struggles you're having, the doubts you're having, the skepticism you're having, the grief that you're having? And allow him to enter in so that you are able to do the same for somebody else who is struggling as well. We have to ask some really hard questions today. How much of what we do as the church 
is about social gathering and friends and how much of it is actually about ministry that reflects Christ. So we're going to begin the change now by doing some really simple things. You need to start with step one is praying today. You need to spend some time in prayer. I'm going to spend some time in prayer. We are going to be praying together and seeking God's discernment and wisdom for our own lives. What about our lives needs to change? Then we're going to engage God in this transformation, engage him. And how do I change this, God? What does the Holy Spirit say to you today? How is that instruction happening inside of you to go and change things? And we're going to engage people. It's time for us to start engaging people that we are running into in work, in life. It's time for us to actually start going out for the purposes of meeting new people that don't know God. And when we do that, we're going to demonstrate bold love. We're going to demonstrate what mercy looks like and forgiveness and justice. We're going to allow people to see us be messy, but we're also going to allow them to see us live this walk in a bold way. I, I know someone who had left the church. They grew up in the church. I had a lot of hypocrisy. They saw people that were trying to make themselves look like good Christians, but underneath had all this sin outrightly going on. And they had left the church. And I asked him one day, what is it that made you come back to church? And he said to me, well, I always loved Christ, but I found all of his followers to be fake until I met a few bikers who had tattoos all over their body, who were not perfect. But I saw how they loved their wives. I saw how they talked about their wives, the way they demonstrated that love, how they appreciated their wives and how they showed it. And I watched them love the way Christ loved. And that made me understand that though we are all hot messes, this is what it looks like to truly walk out my faith. See, in demonstrating the walk in bold ways, in the way we treat other people, in the way we talk about other people, in the way we approach even our social problems. That is where people see where our heart truly is and the God we truly follow. So when we engage God and we engage people, we are going to demonstrate it in tangible, big ways by the words that come out of our mouths and the deeds we do and the issues that we take up in our community to fight for. We're gonna walk with people we are going to walk with them and we are going to witness with them. Witnessing isn't always about words and the stories you share. Sometimes it's about just the very things that you do. But this is about relationship, not just a one-time meeting, not just a one-time prayer, but this is about getting to know someone, entering in with them wherever they're at and allowing them to see you, being vulnerable with them, letting them see the hot mess that you are, that you don't have it all together and you don't know it all. And you're just trying to find your way through this life, just like Thomas and the other disciples. Some days doubting, some days feeling down, some days feeling hopeless. But you trust in a God who walks with you through it all, who knows what it is and gave his life for you. And we're going to gather with those new friends as we grow together. You know, we often think about like, uh, engaging people in a way and witnessing with them. And when they come to faith, okay, now you're going to come to my church. But what if we gather with those friends where they are? And that's the place where we share the gospel. And that's the place where we pray with them. And that's the place where we begin worship. You know, the early church was in house churches. They would go meet people, talk about it in the house. The whole house would gather and that's where worship was had. We've lost a bit of that. So what about ministry for our churches needs to change to begin reflecting the way Christ is calling us today to get up and to go? What does it look like to gather for worship, to gather for prayer and for scripture, to gather for that corporate moment, but then to go out into the mission field, the world, 
trauma and pain and suffering is our new mission field. That was said by Diane Langberg. She is one of the foremost therapists who are dealing with trauma happening all over in our community, in our area. And she said, trauma is going to be our new mission field. And folks, she's right. You have the opportunity to go out in this day, to sit with people where they are in the mess not acting like you have it together, but simply bringing a Holy Spirit that dwells inside you, that brings the power of God, the power of forgiveness, the power of mercy, justice, compassion, and love, to sit and be, and together come to Christ. So friends, as you go forth this day, may this word be sown into your heart. God, we trust in your faithfulness that you walk with us on this journey. And that as the world changes around us, you are yet the same. You call us to move with your spirit. You call us to be led by your spirit. God, help us to step out of our traditions. Help us to step out of our routines and the places that make us comfortable that we might go into this world that we live in, where you have planted us, that we might bring your good news. Give us peace in the moments in where we are anxious and fearful. Remind us of your power and faithfulness when we are uncomfortable. And help us to see and be open to the new opportunities you place in front of us this very day. Amen.
Let us join the church worldwide as we state our faith together using our confession of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As God has planted us in the places that we are, let us lift up our community, our nation, and our world to God in prayer. Let's pray. Healing God, we pray today for those all around us. We pray especially today for those who are in need, especially those who have some type of sickness or disease, God, those who have cancer, diabetes, and perhaps even COVID. God, whatever they are dealing with, whatever type of pain in their body they are seeking, we pray for your healing. Let's start again. Let us lift our loved ones and our community up to God in prayer. Let's pray. Faithful God, we trust that you are at work around us. And so we lift our prayers to you today and pray that you would intercede on our behalf. We pray today, especially for those who are sick, who have de chronic diseases, pain, if anybody has cancer, diabetes, COVID. God, we especially think today of Lynn D'Angelo, the Zimmerman's daughter. We think today of Betty Mayer and Nancy Smaller. We think today of Gail Cotton. We are thinking today, God, of all of those who are struggling this time, for Mike and for Marianne. We pray that you would care for them in this time. Heal them, God. Help them to recover, we pray. We pray today also for those who are grieving, for those who have lost in this day. We pray for the Montenegro family, for the Wilson family, for the Hammond family, for the Rivera family, for the Jansen family, for Frida Fulton, God, for all those who have lost loved ones in this time, we lift them to you and pray, walk with them as a shepherd does, as you walk through the valleys and out into the light in the day of healing. We pray today also for all those who are continuing to work while this pandemic is happening, all those who are essential workers. We especially lift to you, Alyssa and Jennifer, for Peter and Marlene, for Michelle Augustine, for Marianne Freeman. God, for all those who have to continue working, we lift them to you and we pray your protection over them, protection over their families. Give them the extra measure of grace and energy, patience that's needed in this time. And may they know how loved they are. Thank you for their sacrifice that demonstrates to us what love looks like. We lift to you in this time. God, all of our prayers, the needs that we have. We pray especially for those in nursing homes today, those who are shut in. We think of Margaret Atkinson and Edna States, for Frida, Janice's mom, for Tom Neely, for Barbara Colmer and John Horn, Betty Bedford and Jackie Brigden. God, for all of our people right now who are in these places, we think of Dick Gross as well, who is still healing from the loss of Loreen. God, we lift all of them to you and we pray, surround them, allow them to know they are not alone, that we notice them and we care for them. God, we pray especially today for Candy, who is having surgery tomorrow on her foot. We pray that you would allow everything to go well and that her healing would be fast. We also pray today for Mandy, who is recovering from COVID, and we pray God continue to help her heal. We give you thanks for the people around us who have contracted this disease and are on their way to recovery and healing. We thank you for hearing our prayers. 
and we pray, continue, God. We lift all of these prayers to you, spoken and the ones we have left unspoken, praying the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's receive a blessing as we go out. May God the Father be with you this day and forevermore. May you carry with you the love of his son, Jesus Christ. And may you go with the wisdom and the discernment of the Holy Spirit this day and forevermore. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to know more about our church or connect with us, we invite you to go to our website, Bethesda PC. Take care and have a wonderful day.